As a stepping stone between North America and Europe, the island of Newfoundland has played a special role in the development of global telecommunications. It was the western terminus of the world's first transatlantic telegraph cable in the 1860s, and about a century later of the world's first transatlantic telephone cable. And when the Italian inventor Guglielmo Marconi was looking for a place to receive North America's very first radio signal from Europe, he chose Signal Hill. The island's strategic location has earned it a permanent place in telecommunication history. On a much more local level, the new technologies also put Newfoundland and Labrador's scattered population in closer contact with each other and the rest of the world than ever before. The telegraph was the world's first electronic means of communication. At the time, it was a marvel of technology, the 19th century equivalent of text messaging. Devices like this sent electric pulses racing across a wire. Telegraph operators pressed the knob for a short time to create a dot and a longer time to create a dash. The dots and dashes formed an alphabet called Morse code. That was the language of the telegraph. Telegraph lines snaked across much of North America by the year 1850, but they weren't in Newfoundland and Labrador. Frederick Gisborne wanted to change that. He had helped to build a telegraph line between Nova Scotia and Quebec. In 1851, he started a new project to wire the island of Newfoundland and then plug it in to the North American grid. When the new line was completed in 1856, it ran from St. John's to Carbonear, down to Cape Race, and west to Cape Ray, where submarine lines connected it to Cape Breton. News could cross the Atlantic much faster than before. Ships stopped at Cape Race to wire news to media outlets instead of sailing an extra 36 hours to Nova Scotia or another five days to New York. Via Cape Race became a common byline in many European and North American newspapers. And telegraph news was a regular feature of Newfoundland and Labrador newspapers. The American millionaire Cyrus Field had an even bolder plan for the telegraph. He wanted to stretch a submarine cable all the way across the Atlantic Ocean, from Newfoundland to Ireland. The ambitious project pushed the limits of 19th century science and engineering. It also took more than a decade to complete and cost a fortune, but Field was determined to see the project through. At daybreak on July 27, 1866, a giant steamship called the Great Eastern arrived at heart's content from Valencia, Ireland with the final stretch of telegraph cable. Thousands of people were waiting on shore to watch the steamer arrive with its historic cargo. It took 50 people to pull the cable on shore, bring it into the telegraph station, and wire it into the grid. A permanent connection was finally established between Europe and North America. The cable carried about 1,000 messages a month at up to $10 a word. Soon, other cables also connected Newfoundland to Ireland. Commercial, political, and social messages sped across the ocean and throughout the continents. And at the center of it all was the tiny community of heart's content. Today, the cable station exists as a heritage site. The next step in the evolution of telegraphy was for it to go wireless. This new technology was pioneered by the Italian inventor Guglielmo Marconi. In the 1890s, he devised a way to transmit Morse code over radio waves. But how far could the message travel? Could it cross an ocean? Marconi decided to find out. He built a transmitter at Poldhu, England, that could send a signal across the Atlantic Ocean. Its destination was Signal Hill in St. John's. On December 12, 1901, Marconi himself received the world's first transatlantic radio signal at Signal Hill. 
It was the letter S, three quick pips in Morse code, and they were carried by radio waves across 3,500 kilometers. The technology was especially valuable for ships at sea. For centuries, they had to use signal flags and lights to communicate with the outside world. On land, radio also meant a life less lonely for people living in remote communities. This was especially true in Labrador, which was not yet linked to the island by telegraph wires. People who once had to wait weeks or even months for coastal steamers to deliver mail and news could now use wireless telegraphy. By 1906, radio waves weren't just carrying Morse code, they could also transmit human voices and music. The technology was revolutionary, and it paved the way for the world's first form of electronic mass media. Broadcast radio could deliver live programming to a dispersed audience. And at a time when literacy levels were not as high as they are today, radio was an accessible way for all kinds of people to hear news and entertainment. VOWR was one of the earliest radio stations in Newfoundland and Labrador. It started broadcasting church services to St. John's residents in 1924 and later expanded its programming to include music, interviews, and other content. It remains on the air to this day. So does VOCM. It opened in 1936 to broadcast popular entertainment and news. One year after VOCM went on the air, Lester Burry started a radio station at Northwest River in Labrador to broadcast news, weather, and public announcements. This is a photo of a trapper in Labrador tuning in. In 1939, the government launched the Dominion's first public radio station. It was called the Broadcasting Corporation of Newfoundland, but it only existed for 10 years. After confederation with Canada in 1949, the CBC absorbed the BCN. Commercial radio also thrived in this period as a wide range of AM and FM stations began broadcasting. Alexander Graham Bell introduced another form of fast and convenient long-distance communication when he invented the telephone in 1874. The earliest known telephones in Newfoundland and Labrador were installed in 1878, but they weren't for the general public. Postmaster General John Delaney built his own private phone system from instructions he read in Scientific American magazine. His small network connected his house with his co-worker's home. In 1885, the Anglo-American Telegraph Company installed Newfoundland and Labrador's first public telephone system. It relied on a telephone exchange. Human operators used a switchboard to manually connect one phone to another. Unlike Delaney's private system, the public network could provide service to many phones over a much larger area. Newfoundland and Labrador's first telephone switchboard connected phones in St. John's. Over time, telephone service was extended to other places in Newfoundland and Labrador. After direct dialing arrived in 1948, Local newspapers published instructions on how to interact with a dial tone instead of a human operator. In 1955, the cable ship Monarch left Clarenville to install the world's first transatlantic telephone cable. The line ran from Clarenville to Scotland. The submarine line was a technological marvel that provided highly reliable long-distance phone service. It operated from 1956 until 1978. Dozens of submarine cables now cross the Atlantic Ocean. Many use fiber optics to transmit information digitally. Cellular service became available to the province in 1990 and quickly grew in popularity. And in the early 21st century, the development of the smartphone once again revolutionized telecommunications. 
Far from being a mere phone, smartphones also serve as handheld computers, text messengers, digital cameras, and as windows into the internet. When Newfoundland and Labrador joined Canada in 1949, about half of the province's population had electricity. As it became more widespread, so too did radios and television sets. The province's first television station was CJON, which is also known as NTV. It went on the air in 1955 to broadcast local content as well as programming from outside the province. In 1959, CBC opened a studio at Corner Brook. Another one opened at St. John's in 1964. Two years later, color television arrived in Newfoundland and Labrador. And by the 1980s, cable TV was in the province. ABC and NBC were two of the earliest foreign networks that broadcast in Newfoundland and Labrador. In the years that followed, satellite and digital technology allowed local viewers to import hundreds of television channels from around the world. And in the early 21st century, streaming services like Netflix grew in popularity. These allow subscribers to watch content on multiple devices, including from their computers and mobile phones. <laughs>